I know we've got a few people still getting coffee and tea, and I apologise for that, but of course with people on the live stream, um, we, will, we will get cracking. Um, we promised you a smorgasbord of ideas and conversations, and so I'm um, moving along the buffet table now uh, to pick up the topic of how we can future-proof our trading uh, relationships. Joining me for this, um, I think, really timely conversation uh, on my right is Ian Bailey, who is the uh, Managing Director for Kmart. Uh, on his right is Zoe McKenzie, who is the Principal for Trade and Investment Advisory. Um, and on the screen, I think to my right, but in front of me, is Vandita Pant, who's the Chief uh, Commercial Officer with uh, BHP. Um, as always, please um, jump on to the conference app. Um, get your questions going, uh, because I think there will be uh, quite a few questions um, uh, from the audience here and also from our audience online. Vandita, do you want to say hi? Give us a quick wave. <laughs> Hello, um, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Yet so far, so good. Um, we're pleased that you can join us. And, and did I say Vandita's joining us from Singapore, so we really appreciate you making the time available. Um, no. Let me sort of intro this conversation. I think uh, there's no surprises that how we think about trade has really been um, up upset or turned upside down a little bit um, over the past 18 months um, in particular. COVID and closed borders brought the issue of supply chain uh, front and centre. Uh, you know, we've, I think we've become far more aware of what we import and where we get it from. Uh, and COVID really uh, drew us um, to those issues. Uh, but also at the same time, of course, we've had a pretty significant shift uh, in our uh, relationship with China, uh, which has sort of, I guess, um, exacerbated, I think, our, our focus or uh, interest in, in some of our trading relationships. And then uh, to sort of further uh, complicate things or... Uh, you know, draw our attention to the issue of trade. We've had uh, a change in leadership uh, in the US, uh, which has seen a fundamental shift uh, in an approach to uh, multilateral organisations and to the sort of thinking around global engagement, if you like. I think we're at a point prior to the Biden um, election where people were really wondering what future some of those institutions, what future global relationships uh, so there's been an, an awful lot happening and I guess I should also just throw in that new trade deals and relationships uh, with the UK as well on the back of uh, Brexit. So, you know, plenty of meaty topics for us to be uh, jumping into. I'm going to start our, our conversation with you, Zoe. Um, this whole, all of these different um, circumstances have sort of uh, driven this conversation on trade diversification. Uh, in a way that we probably haven't really thought about um, for some time. And, you know, we've, we've, ha we've relied on China, and now all of a sudden people are thinking, well, where do we go to if not China? Mm. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, so I actually think we've been traditionally quite good at diversification. You have to remember that business has always led diversification in this country. 2013, when this government came into power, only 23% of Australia's trade was covered by a free trade agreement, which meant that the heavy lifting, the development of opportunities, the expansion of trade and investment came and was led through business. So business will uh, continue to innovate and continue to grow in that way. Um, DFAT and Austrade do its best uh, to lead the horse to water, but ultimately, if business doesn't take up the heavy lift in this space, uh, diversification will not ensue. We have done it before. We've done it very successfully before. We had to do it in 1973, when our then cash cow, for lack of a better description, which was the UK, turned to the EEC, and we had to come up with alternatives, which we did. We turned to our region, and we did that very successfully. The Chinese-Australia Free Trade Agreement still continues to deliver fantastic economic benefits for this country, but China has not turned out to be the trading partner we'd hoped, or at least not with the constancy we'd hoped. 
So it is time now to make the most of the bevy of other agreements we've got both in the can already but equally being negotiated now to reach out to other new markets. They won't fill the gap in some of those critical industries that have been hit hard by recent sanctions, but they will build opportunities, existing ones and new ones, in a diversified market. So uh, let's just unpack that a little bit more. I, I think um, in some ways people are, you know, we've, we've got the new free trade agreement with the UK. Um, free trade agreements are really important. They do create the sort of framework and structure, if you like. But how important do you think that sort of activity is and the government sort of going out and trying to lead the expansion of new markets is relative to what, what business can be doing. And, and UK, great, but where else should we be pushing then for, for more diversification? Do you see some real jewels, if you like, in terms of opportunity for um, Australian exporters? Well, interestingly, as I said, when this government came into power in 2013, only 23% of trade was covered by an FTA. Now it's closer to 70 and, and galloping on towards 80. So that does mean that um, government is definitely doing its part in terms of settling those agreements, but it also has a dual responsibility, which is to help people use them. To be frank, when it was only 23% and largely covering the markets of big business, um, you could expect the good folk at BHP and elsewhere to plough through the 15 chapters of, a, of an FTA. You can't necessarily expect that of a small or a medium business. So government has come to the party trying to describe those opportunities in plain English, but there's probably more to do. Equally, there's more to do in terms of uh, exploiting some of the agreements we have on foot. Indonesia, in particular, is an extremely important market for us and one that I feel we have not made the most of since that agreement was finalised. Uh, so there is work to be done uh, by governments, but equally by businesses and industry associations who do a lot of the heavy lifting in explaining what agreements mean. There's a good one on tonight, the British Chamber is doing one with the two negotiators from both sides. Those sorts of uh, events are really important to help business know what opportunities are there and how to get out. One thing I also need to say though is that you can't, there's no point doing a free trade agreement until there's a certain critical mass of activity between uh, countries and or regions. If you go in too early, you're not using that agreement to rectify the hurdles in the trade and investment relationship. Uh, think about when we did China. China was finalised in 2015. Australia had already been deeply focused on that market for the better part of 30 years before that agreement was done. So when you get to do that agreement, as we were with the UK, goodness, you know, we're doing the UK now and we've been trading with them since the beginning. So what those agreements can do is knock off the hurdles, the blockers, the frustrations to make the trading relationship that much better in the future. But there needs to be a critical mass of activity before anyone should bother starting to go through the pain that is negotiating a free trade agreement. The other one that's really important for us to make more of is the CPTPP. So at the moment, you've got a bundle of countries who are interested in joining. The UK started negotiating its uh, entry into that club this week. So we need to make more of that. That one actually off opened up markets much more like uh, Mexico and Vietnam. More needs to be made of those agreements that are already done. I'm just going to jump in there and say um, it's, that's a good segue into our poll question where we're asking our audience um, which markets offer the greatest emerging opportunity and Zoe's already spoken to one of those markets so if you've got a view on that please uh, jump into the, into the app and, and put your perspectives forward in, in through the poll. Zoe, one of the things you know, I think when we think about trade it's probably easier to think about the movement of goods um, mm. but uh, services opportunities are, of course, uh, tremendously important to us. How are you seeing the evolution of services trade and how important or, or, how, important or how well are, are those opportunities being reflected, do you think, in the free trade agreements that we've seen? Mm. Uh, and what are the biggest challenges for our services exporters? Mm. So services, to my mind, is the most interesting and exciting part of trade. I know we're a goods exporting country to some extent, but the about 80% of our GDP depends on services, so it's much, it's growingly more important for us to work out how to get services into free trade agreements. Um, 
So particularly as we perhaps look to India, as we look to the UK and the EU, we should have a significant focus on services, even though we tend to still focus on agriculture. Services are harder and frankly, I think, have just got even much harder in the last 18 months to regulate through a free trade agreement. Um, it seems to me there's a dual track in relation to services trade. Big business tends to need to get on a plane. You need to get on a plane, you need to go somewhere, you need to talk it through, you need to finalise deals. Small to medium business can just be done on the screen, right? So, you know, in my business I've gone from normally starting at eight and finishing at six to starting at six in the morning and finishing at nine at night with this big kind of donut in the middle for which I'm very grateful. But it just means you're dealing with the states in the morning and you're dealing with Europe and India at night. And that seems to be fairly um, commonly experienced. I find people working in services industries on a kind of global footing. So, but a lot of that is happening outside the framework of FTAs. So, uh, I'm curious about how our negotiators will capture that level of activity and I actually think at the moment we don't know how big that level of activity is in terms of services trade. That's just everyone getting on with the job, quite frankly. So I might then um, bring you into the conversation, Ian. I think um, when we focus on, on China and the changing relationship there, there's been obviously a real focus on exports. But as I said in my opening comments, COVID focus our attention really squarely, I think, on um, the resilience of supply chains and the imports that we so heavily rely on. Um, I was really, Kmart's role and, and this issue from my perspective was really brought to my attention listening to one of your team just quote some numbers around just exactly how much we do import from China um, and how much Kmart imports from China. So um, really interested in you know, how you think about supply chain diversification from the other perspective and what the experience of the last 18 months has been like from a COVID perspective, but how you're thinking also about sourcing from um, places other than China, if, if you are. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, I, we've, been, we've been on the diversification journey now for at least 10 years. So we've, we've got very big trading relationships with, uh, with India, with Bangladesh and also Indonesia, um, as well as China. Uh, and so we've been working proactively to try and figure out how do we have a more resilient supply chain, how do we have options so that we have a, a stronger relationship with our most important partners. Uh, our model is we connect directly with suppliers in each of the countries. We have team members based in each of those countries and we build very tight relationships to try and help with resilience, which we've really needed through this period of COVID. We, we've seen this experience where you know, the normal demand and supply dynamics have both changed. The demand shifted dramatically through COVID, particularly at the beginning, where we saw categories really expand rapidly, and we'd all know those ones, because we were at home a great deal, and of course other categories completely and utterly declined. Uh, and a business like ours works on being able to predict demand. And so of course if you get sudden volatility, you get a mismatch between demand and supply. And then the second part of the equation has been incredible volatility on the supply side. Now, the factories overall across all, our, all the locations we source from have generally done very well. They've had closures, they've had reduced capacity, uh, and, and similar, similar constraints that we've had in Australia. Uh, but the greater issue has been shipping. Mm. And, uh, and access through the Australian ports has, been a, has, has compounded that as well. And, and what it really teaches us is that a lot of these global, or the, or the global supply chain for everyone um, is a system. And COVID has interrupted that system. And, and so you've got ships which are now in the wrong part of the world. You've got containers in the wrong part of the world. And, you know, if it's a little bit like your, your bus route. If your bus starts getting into the wrong place, sooner or later, two or three buses start arriving at the same time. And, of course, they don't, it's not a very efficient way to move people around the city. It's the same with, it's the, same with the ships. The difference is they can't dock. Nope. And if they can't dock and they can't offload their cargo, then, of course, they've got to miss their next stop. Otherwise, they get out of whack with their sequence. Um, so uh, shipping has become a really big topic for us through this last period of time. Uh, again, we're fortunate. We're very large. We import an incredible number of products into Australia. We're one of the biggest importers of any industry. Mm. Um, and so we have very strong relationships with the international shipping partners. But we're having to really work closely with all of our partners through this period so that we can, we can get really good outcomes for our, for our investors. Let me talk about... Um 
Can I put can I put a bit one of your big numbers on the table? Go for it. So um, and, and and lead into the, just a really direct question around diversification. Um, the number that just sort of caused a bit of pause for me was uh, was the the fact that and I'm not I can't remember which year it was but uh, in a particular year not long ago that Kmart imported 85 million toys from China. 85 million. And I heard that number and I thought, how do you, if we did have to seriously diversify, like how would you actually even start to think about that? Yeah, the 85 million is the total, total number of products we sell in toys. Mm -hmm. And so it does include products from other countries as well. Okay. So, so Lego is in that category and of course doesn't come from China. Um, and equally, there's lots of other products that we purchase, particularly soft toys from, from other countries. Uh, but where you, get, where you get collections of factories and facilities that result in an end product, that's where China really excels and where other countries have so far struggled to compete effectively. So if you think about you've got raw materials and then you have component factories and then you have a factory that compiles those into a finished good, it's a whole network of activity. And you know, countries like Indonesia have got really, really good quality factories that look after end-to-end -end processes, but it wouldn't really work in the toy category. Mm. It's more applicable in clothing and, uh, and soft home and some other categories on the way through. Same in Bangladesh, same in India. So, so what we're seeing is it's quite easy for us to diversify in some categories, and we're very successful at that in clothing uh, as, a, as, a, as a category, soft home as a category. But when you get to things like appliances and toys where there's a large component element, then it's a harder, it's a harder proposition. So on, on the issue of big numbers, um, Vandita, I think that's my opportunity to, to look to you and BHP. Um, iron ore, obviously critically important um, to Australia, to our economic recovery. Uh, it's been pretty important in terms of um, tax revenues and things like that. Um, how are you seeing the outlook um, for iron ore? What's the relationship with China looking like from your perspective? Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Melinda. Um, well, I know um, the fundamentals of the commodity right now are very strong. Uh, in short term, if I were to characterize it, uh, the, the moderately growing uh, uh, China steel industry year on year from last year uh, is continuing and rest of the world has, uh, has also started to give a bit of growth. So overall, strong demand this year. Uh, the, the supply remains uh, patchy in its recovery, as you know, uh, across the world. And what that results in is a very uneven trajectory of price. And I expect uh, volatility in price to continue. Uh, however, if I were to take a minute to think of medium to long term, what do we see? What we see on the demand side is that this, uh, this uh, decade, mid of this decade, is a time when uh, steel uh, starts to plateau. Uh, we call it a plateau phase in uh, China. Uh, rest of the world increases a little bit, but overall, post this decade, it starts to decline. And from a supply perspective, it will normalize over next uh, medium term, and hence, the price outlook for medium to long term has got very different dynamics from where we are today, as you would expect. You did mention about uh, relationships, and that's something uh, which is really critical. When we are trying to get the maximum value based on uh, comparative advantage of uh, our resources and making sure we get optimal placement for those resources on behalf of BHP, but on, on behalf of uh, the people who work for us, the communities and the country, uh, we really invest deeply, strategically in relationships. We have been doing business with our customers in China, for example, for almost a century. And uh, the depth and the quality and the strength of those relationships is really critical uh, to, to ensure that we can continue to supply uh, in, a, in, a, in a customer base, which is going to be an important and critical one for, uh, for a very long time for us. So as a follow-up to that, I, I mean, I think we've seen recent reports out of China that Australia can expect to face uh, something of an economic winter, um, that China is going to be looking to cut its iron ore exports, 
uh, look for other opportunities to expand scrap steel, recycling, and for growing new opportunities of supply in Africa. You know, how do those things you know, influence um, BHP's thinking? And, and how do you, you know, to your point on relationships, you've got that high level sort of messaging coming out. How do you manage that in, in the context of your sort of day-to-day -day commercial relationships? Yeah, sure. So what you mentioned, uh, the move uh, of uh, higher use of scrap, um, the, the move for uh, diversification is absolutely true. And it is uh, like every other country, China is uh, trying to make its own supply chain more resilient and diversify it as well. Uh, but equally, uh, the move uh, to usage of more scrap recycling is something which is not a new phenomenon. We have been forecasting for a very long time, uh, and that is why the plateauing demand forecast that I mentioned about uh, China Steel has been there uh, from BHP for a very long time, because right now, scrap of around 20 odd percent usage, that we see only going up by middle of the century, uh, more than double of it, or, or almost double of it. So some of these structural changes in the industry and its usage are expected. Uh, and uh, are not a cliff event that suddenly has uh, have happened. However, as you did mention, um, the, the commercial relationships are important, but of course they happen in the context of the overall relationship. Um, I think it's fair to say, if I were to step back a minute and say, for, uh, for us, um, looking at our portfolio as a commercial person, I want to make sure that every part of the market where we can place our products most effectively and with most optimal value in line with the trend of the market is something that I want access for. And uh, in a way, the access to every market uh, is the most optimal win-win solutions because nations have different comparative advantages and they fit well. And this, is, uh, this brings prosperity, um, as you know very well, all across, uh, and uh, the backdrop of a good, stable, uh, enabling environment is a, is a, has been a fuel of, uh, of uh, great um, trading uh, uh, trajectories and economic growth. So from my perspective, I think uh, the, the uh, commercial relationship is something that we absolutely, um, we know we have a part to play and we lead it. Uh, overall uh, uh, context of, uh, of the relationship is something which does uh, feed into it, and that can be uh, sometimes uh, challenging and something that we have to, uh, I know, uh, can take some time to work through. But equally, if we step back, uh, these trading relationships, these, uh, these uh, customer relationships have brought, uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone understands, uh, lots of win-win situations for a very long time. And as I see it, can, uh, can continue to bring uh, that kind of value uh, for, for decades to come. Thanks, Vendita. I'm going to pick up on one of your points and, and turn back to you, Zoe. Um, Vendita was sort of um, stressing the importance of access to all markets. Mm. Um, in my opening comments, I talked about the sort of shift, if you like, in, in the sort of global attitude um, to organisations like the WTO, led by the US sort of uh, reasserting its support for, for those types of institutions. You know, how important do you think it is to sort of have the sheriff back in town, so to speak, policing the rules? You talked about, yes, it is hard to regulate services, but, you know, from your perspective, including from for some of the smaller and medium-sized um, players who are looking to access markets, is this a big deal? To have the WTO re-enlivened, yeah, I think it is. I, I sort of I feel this is life's revenge on me because when I was in this building as chief of staff to the trade minister, I spent a lot of time sort of you know kicking the wheels of the WTO and maligning it for not being more effective. Uh, and so now I feel like that's all my fault really, because it has really um, been on its knees in terms of efficacy and impact for the last uh, five years. So the suggestion that that the air is going back into the tyres for the WTO is really very important indeed. Uh, it does have a critical function, particularly in relation to disputes. And having said that, of course, I don't think we should lose the opportunity for reform. Um, 
you know, a significant number of WTO members had got together in order to work out how to have a reimagined WTO in some respects. Uh, and I think that is a worthwhile pursuit still. To my mind, these multilateral bodies tend to atrophy somewhat when they're not accountable or responsible to elected governments. They kind of develop their own culture and their own way of doing things, and they're, they're less subjected to the cold winds uh, that their component members are in terms of what they need to do for domestic economies and domestic constituencies. So I think there is a real opportunity to re-enliven the WTO. Uh, I think everyone is quite relieved to know that minds are focused on WTO 2.0 and what it will be able to do. Um, and, uh, but also not to lose the opportunity to make it a more dynamic body. I'm hoping having uh, Matthias Corman at the OECD will show what dynamism and impact looks like. Uh, and so with any luck, the WTO will follow in that dynamic step. <laughs> well, well, we'll watch this space. Exactly, <laughs> quite right. Um, Ian, um, Mandita also talked a lot about the relationships and I think you know we've um, anyone who's been involved in, in some of these longer term partnerships understands that and the ebbs and flows of that. Um, I think it would be really good for the audience to hear a little bit more about how you've been managing your relationships with suppliers, thinking about this from um, sustainable su supply chains and ethical supply chains, but also the responsibility to suppliers through this pandemic um, and your sort of thinking about their own well-being, if, if I can put it yeah, that way. Absolutely. Relationships get talked about a lot, partnerships get talked about a lot. Uh, but it's, it's in times of crisis that they really, really matter. Uh, because you have that, that history, you have those shared objectives, uh, and you have those common goals. Uh, and I'm glad to say we've invested a, a great deal with our, with our suppliers over the years. And we've moved from transactional relationships to much tighter, more strategic relationships with our key suppliers. And that was really helpful through this, uh, through this last period of time. And we feel very, you know, very fortunate to be in that position. Uh, in terms of how did we help and how did we encourage uh, improvement within some of our suppliers, I, I think it takes two paths. I think there's a, at, the, at the micro level, uh, clearly we, we go to lots of factories. We, we have about a thousand factories that we work with across, uh, primarily across Asia. And so we get, a, we get a very good experience going to so many and we see what's really successful in some factories and we can share those great experiences with others. And through that process, we, we, we effectively help uh, identify opportunities for the factories and then help coach and improve um, in those areas so that we get, we get a better outcome and the factory get a better outcome. And, and what we're constantly looking for are win-win scenarios where through that process, the factory improves, which opens up new opportunities for that factory or for that supplier. And of course, we, we end up with the outcome that we're looking for, which is either improve working conditions, improve pay for the team members, uh, or whatever the, the benefit is that we're looking to achieve through that. So I would call that a continuous improvement model that, uh, that's, that's working very effectively. The second part is when there's a bigger change. And of course, the, there's times when we're working in a particular region or a particular country, and there's a really significant issue. Um, and so there's, so if, it, if I go back a number of years in Bangladesh, we had a number of issues around fire and building safety uh, after a particularly bad uh, incident within that country. Now, no one brand or retailer can fix that. Um, but what we can do is we can work together. I think that was a really good example where the retailers and the brands around the world came together and we joined a group called The Accord uh, for Fire and Building Safety. Uh, we worked jointly with the ILO um, on that as well as, as part of the international labor unions. And then through that, we came up with a program that resulted in real difference in that country around the facilities. And having visited the factories before and having visited the factories after, it is quite incredible the, 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 the lift in quality and the standard that's, uh, that's within that country. And that's an enduring benefit that we can deliver. Uh, well, we can only do that in partnership with others. It's, uh, it's not possible to make those magnitude of large changes just by ourselves, so partnership plays a big role uh, with our peers. I'm glad to say our global peers are very supportive, as are our local ones. So when it comes to these type of issues, everyone does group together, competitive tensions evaporate, um, and it is, it is genuinely a global community who tries to solve these, uh, these problems. When we get into COVID itself, I think this is where being a good partner really matters. Um, now this wasn't true for all of, uh, all of the retailers and all the brands out there globally, and you probably would have read if you think back 18 months or so 15 months ago, 
you know, there was a number of cancellations of orders, particularly from Europe and the US. Um, and that left the, uh, our suppliers in a really difficult position. Uh, they are high volume, low margin businesses. Um, and they, they generally pre-purchase a lot of their raw materials in advance of production. And so, of course, a, a late cancellation leaves them in a really difficult financial position. Uh, so I'm very pleased to say we were able to continue to take all the orders that we placed. Um, we had issues, of course, with some factories had to close or slow production, and we agreed with them we would continue to take those products. Even if it meant we took some winter products so late in the season when they arrived, we pretty much had to mark them down to clear them. Yeah. Uh, because we knew the long-term importance of that supplier, uh, and we knew that their survival would be good for us in the long run and good for them. And so we saw it as an opportunity to tighten those strategic relationships with our partners by demonstrating that it is more than a transactional relationship. Yeah. And we've continued with that as we've gone through the program. I think that's a really interesting point. And anyone who's, um, I think, been party or to understanding those trading relationships, particularly when they're longer term, it, you, can, you can kind of look at the contracts and think, yes, this is the contract and the transactional nature of it. But actually, when push comes to shove, there's a, it's a heck of a lot more nuanced than that. Mm. And if you are thinking about the long-term relationship, you're sort of looking at the, the ink on the contract going, am I really going to enforce that take or pay? Or am I really going to, yes, I can cancel this order, but am I really going to do that you know, with an hour to go before they ship it? It's, I think it's a, a really interesting point. I've got a bunch of questions coming in uh, on the app. Vandita, I'm just going to put you on notice. We are going to come back and talk about um, decarbonisation and climate change and some of the, the directions of your um, major customer countries, if I can put it that way. Um, I would like to also just say that if there are uh, questions in the room that haven't come through the app and you want to wave your hand around, you can do that while I ask the first question which I've got here. Um, and I'll, I'll shorten it, and it's really a question for everyone, I think. We've talked about the relationships with business, we've talked about the role of government, if you like, in, in establishing the frameworks through free trade agreements and supporting multilateral organisations. But let's personalise it a little bit more in the role of government. The question is really about the role of government ministers um, and whether or not they should be um, playing more of a role or, or understanding the role that their diplomacy can play in, in perhaps helping to grease the wheels of trade, if I, if I put it that way. Um, I might start with you on that, Zoe. I mean, I think we see ministers travelling all over the world. We've seen the Prime Minister recently in the, at the G7. Mm. Is it something that we should, you know, be expecting him to sort of be talking not just about the really high level, but then looking at opportunities, or is that too nitty-gritty? No, I actually think that... Um, this is what I tell my clients, is that the best time to get business done is in the lead-up to an FTA being signed, not certainly not after it's signed, because the horse is somewhat bolted by then. So there's an enormous amount of energy and curiosity as a deal is being done. And so the ministers themselves give a sense of momentum, gravitas, it's going to happen, we've put our necks on the line, we are being held accountable for getting these deals done for the Australian economy. So they do create the sense of it will happen and you should be looking for the opportunities now. So I do think that's great. I was actually really thrilled that the Prime Minister got out of Australia because I think he will then say, uh oh, business is still happening at quite a pace elsewhere. And we are still getting things done. I think Australians are better than most at being able to get things done wherever we are, you know, working in airport lounges, trams, wherever you happen to be. So I still think there's a lot that can get done, particularly in that critical services sector. But, and, so, and in importance of what Ian says, just listening to you, so lucky you've got people in country because if you didn't and you couldn't get there, so many of those partnerships would be f more frail now than they are. So most of us don't, most businesses don't have the opportunity of a significant infrastructure in country and they need to be seen to maintain the vibrancy of those relationships. So yes, I think ministers can and should get out if only to remind themselves how critical it is, particularly at the big business end, to be able to get out there, do deals, create trust, build those partnerships. Bandita, any thoughts from you? We're talking can you hear about, me? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Say that again, Melinda. I lost you for a minute. No, no, that's fine. We were just having talking about the role that ministers might play in... Um, you know, helping to facilitate trade opportunities. So you've got business, and a, and a big business like BHP obviously can look after itself, but is it something that you think government should be doing, you know, ministers should be doing more of in terms of 
supporting uh, supporting the cause of, of of Australian businesses? I I I swim in a very narrow lane, if I can say it that way, Melinda, of of commercial bit. So uh, it would be uh, a bit strange for me to give advice to to uh, ministers and politicians. But what I would uh, definitely say is uh, the strong uh, bilateral and international trades uh, are a building block uh, to enable business, uh, uh, business uh, be it big or small, to go and fill that space in every market, in uh, every kind of uh, relationship. So absolutely, uh, that, is, that is a place, uh, but one of the considerations, I absolutely acknowledge, it is one of the considerations that uh, the ministers uh, have to take into account. Uh, uh, but overall, uh, strong bilateral relationships or a backdrop, if I can put it that way, is uh, is uh, enabling for the for the business, but also very much acknowledge that there can be challenges and ups and downs, and uh, sometimes it takes uh, takes a bit of time and effort by everyone uh, over a period of time to to solve some complex problems. Thanks. Now I'm just going to glance around in the bright lights and see if there's any hands going up. Otherwise, I will keep going off my questions uh, here. A couple of questions really around picking up on this um, point about strengthening global, global multilateral institutions. And, and I guess the sentiment of it is, um, is it really the right way to go? It's, and also, I guess, you know, the more formal structures of FTAs. Mm -hmm. And I think that if I can capture the sentiment, it, it is, it's all well and good, but we've seen, I guess, through Trump, how quickly things change. So, you know, I guess is it are these the, the baskets that we should be really putting our eggs in or are there other things that we should be looking to pursue when they can change overnight and does that leave you sort of high and dry? Yeah, absolutely. I think we've seen um, with painful effect just how uh, hard and slow it is to seek redress through a free trade agreement even when the free trade agreement provides for redress. They are slow. They are heavily laden with uh, relationship-based issues. You don't just get to flick a switch, go to the cops and say so-and-so is being naughty, so it's quite challenging to enforce them. And so obviously the relationship under the FTA needs to be extremely robust. I know in trade we like to throw out the trump card quite often uh, in terms of impact on the global trading system, but it's also very interesting to look at what's happened to this kind of rules-based order in the trading system over vaccines and exports uh, and the supply chain in and around vaccines. Those poor people at BioNTech, all of whose benefit we've got shoved in our arms now, but that's got 280 ingredients across something like 60 different countries. Um, for a while there, you know, the EU, the UK and others were playing sort of funny buggers, frankly, with exports of vaccines. So everyone was playing America first for a while there. Um, so that shows you that these systems aren't foolproof, uh, they aren't as robust as you like, and to some extent the, the parties involved just have to knuckle down and, and sort it out, which ultimately they did, but it, you know, it takes six months, and that's the six months that we now blame for a delay in an Australian vaccine program. Ian, let me sort of just twist this a little bit if I can, just to, I think one of the things that would be interesting to really understand is how an organisation like yours actually deals with or engages with these, these institutions or not. I mean, you talked about you know, working in collaboration in response to particular circumstances in Bangladesh. You mentioned the ILO. I mean, how does an organisation like yours, do you get involved with the WTO? Is it, is it something that's on your radar screen? Where does it factor? Yeah, not so much the, not so much the WTO. We're generally looking at who we can, who we can work with around the big topics at the time. Mm -hmm. and, and so, of course, if we look at things like sustainability, which is becoming an increasingly large topic, then we do start to engage with, uh, with the United Nations and, and some of their sub subgroups, so that we can, again we can partner with the, with the best in the world, with some of the best minds, as well as other um, other big retailers. So again, we've got that leverage. So we're generally looking for the right partners at the right time that can really help. Uh, I think when you look at the the trading side of the equation, our primary pathway is to work closely with our suppliers and to build those tight relationships. And then we really look for the framework of us having a good relationship country to country. Mm. It just helps facilitate that. 
And if, if you're engaging with the UN on something, is it is it something that you are then working through government, or do you, do you actually dedicate your own resources? And what does that look like? Um, now we dedicate our own resources, so we we will we will connect directly with the group that's really focused on that. There, there's generally a, a leader of, you know, if I, if I take something like um, like ACT, which was Action, Collaboration, and Transformation, which is around improving minimum wage uh, to a living wage in in a, a number of countries. Then, then we will work very closely with the leader and that, and that top team, who are generally based out in Europe somewhere, but with a global remit. Um, and, and we encourage them to come to Australia, so that was a really good example where we got the leader to come visit us, I think this was about five years ago now, and then we ran a session with Australian retailers to try and get more of them on board with that program. So that the nature of our business and the scale that we have within, within this market, we, we see ourselves needing to take these leadership positions and the scale also gives us the ability to be meaningful on a global scale, which then is also helpful mm. for us to bring that back to this market. Um, Vandita, I said I promised I was going to come back on uh, decarbonisation. Um, sustainability comes up, uh, it's just come up again. So how, how is BHP thinking about the impl implications of countries like Japan, Korea, China, um, moving forward on decarbonisation and, and how, what it, how is that going to impact um, your sort of longer term thinking as an organisation and, and exports, your export trajectory? Yeah, sure. Well, that's a fantastic opportunity for us. Um, you are absolutely right. The kind of commitments uh, in just last less than a year from uh, most of our um, uh, customer markets, uh, be it China, Korea, Japan, and even in India, talking about renewable energy in a very different, uh, different way, um, is a real opportunity. And why do I say that? I say that because uh, it accelerates uh, the demand for uh, the portfolio of commodities that we have. So, um, for example, the decarbonization as a trend and climate change as something, as a thematic that uh, uh, countries and industries are putting up, uh, means that uh, um, one and a half degree world um, compared to the pre-industrial uh, era, if you will, uh, is very much positive for BHP and our commodities. Uh, for example, in fact, in a Paris aligned world, for next 30 odd years, the demand for copper, which is a really important uh, metal for decarbonization, if, is going to be almost double than what it was for last 30. Uh, for nickel, in the next 30 years, uh, leveraging on the decarbonization around the electrification uh, of transport uh, trends, the demand will be almost four times than what it was in the last 30 years. And even steel, in one and a half degree Paris aligned world, uh, the demand goes up to twice uh, over next uh, 30 years uh, than, than last uh, 30. And potash uh, as, an, as a commodity is very positively leveraged towards uh, decarbonization as well, given the efficiency of land use uh, becomes really important. So overall, from a portfolio perspective, uh, this, uh, this trend is actually mo makes BHP and our portfolio more valuable. And hence, from that perspective, we really are leaning into it, not only from our commitments perspective, but these are challenges which cannot be done by one country, one industry, uh, one sector only. And hence, uh, strongly aligning ourselves along with our suppliers at one end, but equally our customers at another, through the value chain um, uh, perspective, uh, as Ian was mentioning, really critical to, to, uh, to activate the full ecosystem of this value chain to solve these strategic decarbonization issues together, because they bring more value in effect. In, uh, and, and you may know, Melinda, that we have done uh, quite strategic partnerships in last uh, uh, less than a year, last eight months or so, with the biggest steel mill in uh, China uh, as MOU to work around uh, low carbon technologies for uh, steel decarbonization, Bawu, uh, with the second largest uh, steel mill in China, which also happens to be the worldwide uh, second largest mill, and second largest steel mill in Japan, 
So between these, almost 10% of steel producers are already, uh, we are partnering with to figure out what the uh, trajectory for low carbon uh, uh, technology can be for steel industry. And that's not the only place. We are also making real, um, accelerating our uh, actions on maritime. As you know, BHP is one of the largest uh, dry bulk charters uh, in the world. And uh, we became the first, uh, we, we tendered the world's first uh, LNG uh, Newcastle Max uh, order uh, last year, uh, which will reduce our uh, uh, footprint on per voyage basis by 30% on uh, uh, carbon emissions uh, for, for the iron ore, which goes from Port Hedland to, to our markets. And I see this as uh, not just value creating, which it is a portfolio, but also an underpinning of uh, creating real commonality of uh, purpose and uh, alignment of uh, views uh, on strategic themes which matter to us and to our customers, which only uh, strengthen our relationship and move it away from here and now one transaction to long-term issues to be solved together. Yeah, thank you, Vandita. We've got one question in the room here. If prompted by my, my, my question is prompted by the numbers millions that you give at the very beginning of uh, significant uh, input products, uh, of significant products that we input from uh, China, not from perspective of dependency on China or any, or any other. Sorry, I can't, I, we're just struggling to hear you up here. It's pretty tricky. Should I? My question is prompted by the, the data uh, millions that you cited at the very beginning uh, of products that we import from China, and not from perspective of dependency on China or any specific country, but whether this import is justified as such, and whether uh, tensions with China might prompt us, trade tensions uh, might prompt us to rethink uh, our policy towards consumption in general. And also, uh, where the government uh, might, might take a uh, role in that. And how do trade chains such as Kmart uh, address uh, move towards uh, circular economy uh, in, in parallel with, with this? Is there any need to reinvent their strategy while incorporating uh, calls for more circular and recyclable economy? Because otherwise their profit is inevitably linked to, to selling products. Thank you. I'm I, I, can I use my prerogative to say we are going to do circular economy as a, as a full topic, but I think, can I paraphrase, so was the, the, the thrust of your question, you know, the, the fact that um, supply, maybe one of the things we need to do is actually reduce our um, imports from China um, as part of a broader approach to sustainability? Not, not, not specifically from China, but maybe reconsider our consumption as such and uh, reinvent uh, some of our production. Well, I think that's a really tricky question for you, Ian. <laughs> it's, uh, well, it's, a, it's a topic that's on people's minds, and increasingly so. So uh, if I just answer it from the circular economy piece and, and how, does, how do we see that playing out as time passes, um, I think it's a topic that is on people's minds. You know, I, I think we've all seen what's happened with recycling in the last few years and, and how that's playing out. And it does weigh on our minds that we consume a lot of products as a nation and, and where do they go when they, uh, when they end their, their usefulness with us. As the, uh, as the consumers. So it's something that we're working on you know, increasingly as time passes now. We've, we've already taken some actions on the relatively easy side of the equation. So we've removed um, half, a, it's, it's 500 million, it sounds like a big number, it is, of, of single-use plastic items. Uh, now that's not 500 million products. You know, if you've got a pack of 20 plastic knives and forks, that would be 20, of course, within that, if you're trying to figure out how can you get a number that big. But it's still 20 million things, which are no, oh, sorry, 500 million things, which are no longer, you know, going into landfill that won't degrade um, on the way through. And we replace those with with new products, which are, which are very price competitive. And I think this is the challenge for us, particularly when you look at the the value equation that we offer to our customers. And, and you go to some of the conversations we've had as we've gone through today's session around, you know, life isn't necessarily easy in Australia for lots of people and they don't have, Australians don't have, don't have a lot of money to go and spend on their daily needs, this is what we help them with. But what we're doing is we're bringing that down to, through mass, bringing that down to an affordable price point. So if I look at clothing, uh, which is another big area which contributes to this area, we're expanding our use of recycled polyester 
Um, so we've got, a, we've got an ambition there to get that in the target business to 100% by 2025, 50% for Kmart in that period. I think we'll probably be ahead of that. But we are reliant upon the technology continuing to improve and the availability of those raw materials coming through uh, in the volumes that we need so that we can, uh, we can deliver on those promises. But so that's, I guess there are two quick examples that we're looking at as to how we help uh, deliver more products which have the ability to be recycled or be able to de degrade naturally. Um, I'm going to ask one last question and I apologise because we've only got a couple of minutes so we, we are going to have to be perhaps short and concise and it's maybe unfair because it's a big question but um, to each of you really, borders remain closed, unlikely to open for some time yet. How big a deal is that? Um, for the businesses that you're trying to conduct, be they import or export? Zoe? Oh, um, I actually think it is a really big deal because particularly when you've got new uh, and likely to be finalised soon FTAs, unless you are out and about doing the deals that are going to be facilitated by those FTAs, you'll sort of let them sit there for a while and frankly... Um, every subsequent FTA usually offers a most favoured nation clause, meaning the next FTA partner gets the benefit. So the UK will go from here to doing one probably with the US, although that is paused for the moment, may well pick up the reins again on India, which is something we should be doing as well. And they're out and about, they're doing business. People are still getting on the planes and doing business trips, but we are not. So to my mind, it creates a sense of, um, as we were talking about last night, uh, lethargy and um, patience that these opportunities will be there in a year's time, and I don't think they will. Ian? We're fortunate. We have an established business. We've got strong relationships with our partners, um, but of course they are relationships. Mm. And you know, if you move out of the work context, and, and you think about you know, the friends or family that you've got in different parts of the world who you can no longer connect with, you know, you, you're starting to feel more and more distant from them. Mm -hmm. You're not as connected to their daily lives. You, your relationship's not as tight. So I think this is uh, one of those slightly insidi insidious things. That on, any, on any one day, it's no worse than the previous day, but, but over time, of course, it is. And I, I think there's this, this slow degradation of relationships which is occurring, and the longer it goes, I guess, the more problematic it will become. I think we'll feel the impacts of that, in, not necessarily today, but probably in a year or two years' time. Yeah, thanks. Vandita, you know, as someone who's, who's not in Australia, what, what does it feel like or what's the sense of, you know, Australia's closed borders from Singapore? Yeah, from Singapore, uh, not just for Australia, but also Asia, uh, it, it is an issue, and I agree. Uh, thank God for our technology and the fact that everyone's uh, shifted their way of working. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on the calls and virtual, uh, these kind of uh, forums with the customers all across Asia, and that we have continued to do. Having said that, there is a glue of social capital, <laughs> which is FaceTime. Uh, relationships are based on that. And uh, um, I hope that uh, soon the border uh, restrictions can be lifted because uh, this is uh, really critical. Our, our uh, co-creation, <laughs> really strengthening the relationships and um, having, having that putting back into that box, the social capital, um, happens when we go and see our customers and our stakeholders globally uh, face to face. So looking forward to being on the plane again, which I never thought I would say again. But <laughs> yeah, no, are. I know. I know. Well, thank you for that. Um, let me just give you a quick update on the poll question. Which market offers the greatest emerging opportunity for Australian trade? Uh, India topped uh, the score at 47.8% of the responses, uh, closely followed by Indonesia. Absolutely. Nearly 35%, then Vietnam uh, and Europe on equal pegging, and the UK, a donut. Oh, that's so, a big donut for the UK, notwithstanding uh, recent um, free trade agreements. Um, I re appreciate there's a lot of questions that have come through on the poll. One of the things that we'll try to do is maybe see if we can encourage our um, panellists or others to provide some perspectives on those. Keep an eye on the website. We'll see if we can address that through a blog or something like that because there was clearly a lot of interest in, in the topic, not surprisingly, for a great trading nation and a nation whose 
uh, prosperity has been built on global engagement that um, this would be such uh, an interesting topic um, at this particular point in time. Thanks very much. We're going to have a really short break before we move on to uh, the next session. And if you could just join me in thanking our panellists.